so it makes it easier for the ushers to pass the offering plate. All right. Are there any other announcements, Wayne? Okay. All right. Please take just a quiet moment to prepare your hearts and minds for worship, and we will begin very shortly with Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness. In your great compassion, blot out my offenses. Wash me through and through from my wickedness and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. And so you are justified when you speak, and upright in your judgment. Indeed, I have been wicked from my birth, a sinner from my mother's womb. For behold, you look for truth deep within me, and will make me understand wisdom secretly. Purge me from my sin, and I shall be pure. Wash me, and I shall be clean again. Make me hear of joy and gladness, that the body you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit. Give me the joy of your saving help again, and sustain me with your bountiful spirit. I shall teach your ways to the wicked, and sinners shall return to you. Deliver me from death, O God, and my tongue shall sing of your righteousness, O God of my salvation. Had you desired it, I would have offered sacrifice, but you take no delight in burnt offerings. The sacrifice of God is a troubled spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O oh God, you will not despise. Be favorable and gracious to Zion and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Glory, Glory to, to the, the Father and, and to the, the Son, Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, God created us to experience joy in communion with him, to love all humanity, and to live in harmony with all of his creation. But sin separates us from God, our neighbors, and creation. And so we do not enjoy the life our creator intended for us. Also, by our sin, we grieve our father, who does not desire us to come under his judgment, but to turn to him and live. As disciples of the Lord Jesus, we are called to struggle against everything that leads us away from love of God and neighbor Repentance, fasting, prayer, and works of love, the discipline of Lent, help us to wage our spiritual warfare. I invite you, therefore, to commit yourselves to this struggle 
and confess your sins, asking our Father for strength to persevere in your Lenten discipline. Holy and merciful Father, we confess to you and to one another and to the whole communion of saints in heaven and on earth that we have sinned by our own fault in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. Our whole heart and mind and strength we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We have not forgiven others as we have been forgiven. Have, have mercy, mercy on us, us Lord. Lord. We have been deaf to your call to serve as Christ served us. We have not been true to the mind of Christ. We have grieved your Holy Spirit. Have, have mercy, mercy on us, us Lord. Lord. We confess to you, Lord, all our past unfaithfulness the pride, hypocrisy, and impatience in our lives. We confess to you, Lord, our self-indulgent appetites and ways and our exploitation of other people. We confess to you, Lord, our anger at our own frustration and our envy of those more fortunate than ourselves. We confess to you, Lord, our intemperate love of worldly goods and comforts and our dishonesty in daily life and work, we confess to you, Lord. Our negligence in prayer and worship and our failure to commend the faith that is in us, we confess to you, Lord. Accept our repentance, Lord, for the wrongs we have done, for our blindness to human need and suffering, and our indifference to ju injustice and cruelty. Accept our repentance, Lord. For all false judgments, for uncharitable thoughts toward our neighbors, and for our prejudice and contempt towards those who differ from us. Accept our repentance, Lord. For our waste and pollution of your creation, and our lack of concern for those who come after us, Accept our repentance, Lord. Restore us, good Lord, and let your anger depart from us. Hear us, Lord, for your mercy is great. Amen. Remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall
Finish in us, O God, the work of your salvation, that we may show forth your glory in the world. Son, our Lord. Bring us with all your saints to the joy of his resurrection. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, does not desire the death of sinners, but rather that they may turn from their wickedness and live. Therefore, we implore him to grant us true repentance and his Holy Spirit, that those things may please him which we do on this day, that the rest of our life may be pure and holy, and that at the last we may come to his eternal joy. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. I invite you to stand as you are able as we pray together our prayer of the day. Almighty and everlasting God, you hate nothing you have made and forgive the sins of all those who are penitent. Create in us new and contrite hearts that we, worthily lamenting our sins, and acknowledging our wretchedness, may obtain from you, the God of all mercy, perfect remission and forgiveness. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. The first reading comes from the book of Joel, the second chapter. Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, consecrate the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, even nursing infants. Let the bridegroom leave his room, and the bride her chamber. Between the vestibule and the altar, let the priest, the ministers of the Lord, weep and say, Spare your people, O Lord, and make not your heritage a reproach, a byword among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, Where is their God? Then the Lord became jealous for his land and had pity on his people. The Lord answered and said to his people, Behold, I am sending to you grain, wine, and oil, and you will be satisfied, and I will no more make you a reproach among the nations. The word of the Lord. We will now sing Psalm 103 responsibly by a whole verse. And all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. He forgives all your sins and heals all your infirmities. He redeems your life from the grave and crowns you with mercy and loving kindness. 
He satisfies you with good things, and your youth is renewed like an eagle's. The Lord executes righteousness and judgment for all who are oppressed. He made his ways known to Moses and his works to the children of Israel. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy, slow to anger and of great kindness. He will not always accuse us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our wickedness. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so is his mercy great upon those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our sins from us. As a father cares for his children, so does the Lord care for those who fear him. He remembers that we are but dust. Our days are like the grass. We flourish like a flower of the field. When the wind goes over it, it is gone, and its place shall know it no more. But the merciful goodness of the Lord endures forever on those who fear him and his righteousness on children's children. On those who keep his covenant and remember his commandments and do them. The second reading is from 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Working together with him, then, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in a favorable time I listened to you, and in a day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We put no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way by, in, by great endurance in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love, by truthful speech, and the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, through honor and dishonor, through slander and praise, we are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown, and yet well known, as dying, and behold, we live, as punished, and yet not killed, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, yet possessing everything. The word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks to God. God. Turn to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the sixth chapter. Glory to you. Jesus said, 
Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites. For they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you. seated. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Ashes have long been used by God's people for a variety of purposes. In the Old Testament, ashes were used as an expression of sorrow and grief. The ashes themselves were sprinkled on the head, even when wearing a head covering. The more ashes on your head, the greater your sorrow. Ashes could also accompany other expressions of sorrow, such as the tearing of clothes, the rending, as the Old Testament reading puts it, crying out loud, fasting. Now, ashes also suggest cleansing and renewal. They were once used as a cleansing agent when soap was not available. On Ash Wednesday, the ashes have sometimes been understood as a penitential substitute for water, as a sign of baptism. And baptism is absolutely a focus of this season we're about to start. Ashes are a remnant of something that has been burned and destroyed, and so they remind us of death. But they are also meant to remind us of renewal. You see, ancient farmers used to burn their fields in the spring. This was to destroy the old and prepare for the new. Our modern Christian practice of marking a cross on our foreheads using ashes goes back centuries, well before medieval times. But it has its roots going back much farther, all the way to the very beginnings of our faith. So with this act of imposing ashes on our foreheads, we begin a new season of the church year, the season of Lent. This entire season is about repentance and renewal. The word Lent itself comes from an Anglo-Saxon word that means springtime. 
So our church season of Lent is a holy springtime of the soul, a time for preparation and planting and growth. Now, I don't know if you noticed, but after we had all received our ashes, we concluded that lengthy confession, and the last prayer I said down here was a plea to all of us and to God for true repentance. We prayed for that. But you did not hear a word of absolution. There was no declaration of forgiveness yet. We will save that for Maundy Thursday. That means this whole period of time between tonight and that Thursday in Holy Week This whole season is a time of penitence and reflection. I very much appreciate the image of the farmer burning his field in the spring to destroy the old and prepare for the new. I think that's a wonderful way to picture a Lenten journey. Because I think Lent is more than just giving something up, right? That's how people often think of Lent. I'm giving something up. Now, don't get me wrong. I commend those of you and whoever you know that gives something up for Lent. It is certainly a discipline. It is definitely a fast, as we call it, which is reminiscent of Jesus' 40 days in the wilderness, fasting after his baptism, facing temptation. But I want us to think of Lent as Pursuing something that will help us in our faith. Pursuing something that will help us in our faith. Let me explain. Many people give up something like chocolate for Lent, right? That's a common one. And if chocolate is something that dominates your thoughts and cravings on a daily basis around the year, and you give it up for 40 days as a way for you to appreciate what Jesus gave up for us. And then you spend a little time in prayer and in the word. Then yeah, I 100% support you giving up chocolate for Lent. But what happens Easter morning then? You still eating chocolate? Do you dive head first into that basket of sugary yummy? And make up for all the chocolate you haven't had for 40 days? Have you grown in your faith? Did giving up chocolate for Lent help you grow in your faith? As I've taken my own journey of faith in the last 10 years, several mentors have shown me this period in our church year should be spent pursuing that which helps me grow in my faith. Maybe it is giving something up. That's possible. Maybe. But maybe it's starting something that I haven't been doing. For instance, maybe I've only been reading my Bible once a week outside of Sunday morning. So, Now I'm going to set aside, you know, 10 minutes a day to read my Bible every day during the season of Lent. Or maybe I'm going to do something totally new that I've never done before. Like maybe I'll serve at the soup kitchen once a week through Lent. Maybe I'll volunteer at the food pantry across the street that we're partnered with that other church to do that's always looking for help, hint, hint. Maybe I'm going to do something to live out the commandment to love my neighbor. For me personally, what I'm going to do this Lenten season is something that's long overdue. I'm going to focus on the third commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. In the last year and a half, it's become abundantly and painfully clear to me that I have completely disregarded this commandment for a very long time. 
I'm sorry to have to admit that, but it's true. So I'm going to make a change in my life over the next 40 days. And actually, I would invite all of you to consider that too. What is your practice on the Sabbath day? The first thing I'm going to do is this. I'm not going to do anything on a Sunday that requires anybody else to work. This is not an original idea, by the way. One of my mentors does this as his own Sabbath practice. That means I'm not going to go shopping. I'm not going to go out to eat. This does not include church work. Holy, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, means set apart for God and his purposes. So, But I'm not going to go to restaurants. I'm not going to go to stores. That's going to take some preparation and some planning. And my family and I have been talking about this, and we've agreed to do it together because it's going to take our whole household. And it's important. It's important for many reasons. So I ask your prayers for my family and I as we undertake this discipline through this Lenten season. If you decide to join us and take this on, I would very much like to compare notes at the end of the season and compare experiences and see what changes you've noticed. You see, the next 40 days remind us of the journey our Lord took on His way to the cross. We know how His journey ends, don't we? It was our sin, our disobedience, our unwillingness to live our lives the way God wanted us to that made His journey to the cross necessary in the first place. This time is given to us to reflect on that. We look inwardly at ourselves in those places where we don't want to look. How's my life of faith? How am I doing? Where could I improve? What sins do I struggle with? What could I do better? How can I grow in my faith? How can I walk closer with God? As you look around our worship space tonight, do you notice any changes? I hope so. During Lent, we remove a few things. First of all, there's no embroidery on the pyramids, right? Yes, we've changed the color purple. Purple has significance for this season, too. There's no images anywhere, okay? We've removed all the banners. We don't say, hallelujah, during this season, right? It's removed from the liturgy. You didn't sing it before the reading of the gospel. Even our hallelujah banners in the back corners are removed from the worship space. Part of the reason for this is that the only thing right now that should draw your attention is the cross. Everything else is a distraction. This is what we focus on. The cross is really all we need to think about right now, isn't it? What happened on that cross? Who was put there? Why he was put there? And finally, when this Lenten journey is over, he will tell us himself that the good and wonderful news is the journey didn't end there because death isn't the end of the story. Thanks be to God. So if you're still not sure what your Lenten journey is going to look like, then I would invite you to take another look at the easel I've brought back upstairs. You may not be able to read it from that far away, but swing by after the service and take a look. This is the list we made six months ago yesterday. 
Six months ago, we had our Fresh Eyes for Mission Summit. We talked about our vision, our own vision for our congregation that we discern together in prayer and with the work of the Holy Spirit among us. The very first vision point is be a great commission church. Be a great commission church. That is, of course, a reference to Jesus' great commission. When he said to his followers, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. That's the great commission. So if we're going to be that kind of church, making disciples... We need to model the discipleship that we're going to introduce people to. I think it's incredibly appropriate for us then to spend this season of Lent growing in our own discipleship, individually and together as a church family. So, what does that mean? The great Lutheran question, right? What does it mean for you to grow in your discipleship? Your discipleship and your discipleship. Right? What does that mean? What does it look like? Let me offer you this. Jesus basically gave us two rules. Love God, love neighbor. He used a few more words than that, but that's what it boils down to. Love God, love neighbor. So ultimately, our discipleship boils down to those two things. So what can we do better? What can we do to love God better? What can I do to love God better? Well, for me, that's why I'm going to try to obey his commandment to me better, to honor the Sabbath day and keep it holy because I recognize I haven't been obeying him in that regard. What can we do to love neighbor better? What can I do to love my neighbor better? Here's one idea. Have you signed up for the craft and yard sale in April yet? April 22nd, right? We're going to use our proceeds for that event to support some of our ministries in the church. Sounds like a good thing. And then after that, just a couple weeks later, we're going to be the host for the annual Carolinas Mission Region Convocation held here in our church pastors and delegates from our fellow NALC congregations all across North and South Carolina will converge here in May to do the business of the church, to worship together, to plan the next year together, to share the good things that all of us have been doing together and separately, and to see where we can help each other as a mission region, as a big C church. There is definitely some discipleship and some opportunity for discipleship going on there. And guess what? It's going to take some effort from us as hosts, and I guarantee you Paula is going to need some extra help. (laughs) Contact her. She will appreciate any volunteers. A couple of ideas for you. Not an all-inclusive list. But as you look at the ashes on your forehead tonight, either in the mirror later or shortly in this sanctuary, looking at each other, passing each other in Holy Communion, sharing the peace, think about what this means. Think about the cross shape that it's drawn in. Think about what those ashes symbolize what they have been used for throughout the history of our faith. 
As you think of that, consider what your Lenten discipline might be. Maybe it's something you do alone. Maybe it's something you do with family. Maybe it's something you do with a friend who will hold you accountable and you will hold them accountable. But remember that all of us bear that cross. All of us are called to penitence. All of us need renewal. And with all the noise and chaos in the world right now, there is no better time than right now to lean into our faith through this season of Lent. No matter what the world throws at us, no matter how ugly the news gets or how awful things around us seem, no matter what names they call us for being people of faith, there's nowhere better to spend our time and our energy than in the Word of God. There's no one better to spend our time with than with the God who sent his only son to be among us, to teach us, to die for us. The more we focus on him, the more time we spend with him, the more our faith grows, the better we will be able and ready to handle everything else. So let's all pray for each other as we embark on this journey this journey of reflection and discipline and renewal. Let's pray that we will grow in our faith and our understanding of God's will for us as individuals, as disciples, as a church. Let's pray that all of us will be better, better disciples 40 days from now than we are today. Let's pray that we will enter into the next part of the church year ready to follow wherever it is that God is leading us to be a Great Commission church, to grow in our outreach, to grow in our stewardship. Then, then we can watch the amazing things the Holy Spirit will do as he goes to work in our church family and in our community. I'm excited to be a part of that. I pray you are too. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our hymn of the day is number 734 in With One Voice, Softly and Tenderly. I invite you to stand as you are able.
faithfulness of the church, the life of the world, and all those in need. Most merciful God, by your Spirit, make us mindful of our transgressions. Through your word, draw us to repent of our sinfulness and turn our hearts toward you once again. Create in us clean hearts and renew a right spirit within us. Then, in your abundant mercy, restore to us the joy of your salvation. Lord, in your mercy. Your honor. Heavenly Father, through a small smudge of ash, reminds us, remind us that apart from you, we are nothing. You are our source and life, our beginning and our end. In your boundless mercy, restore us to wholeness and welcome those who have wandered far from the embrace of your love and seek to return to you. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Most gracious God, even as we are reminded that we are dust and to dust we shall return, we cling to your promise to be with us always. Continue to uphold those to whom you have given many years with strength and dignity in your loving care. Abide with them, gracious God, that they might continue to bear witness to your unending presence. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Gracious Lord, we ask that you would comfort all those who mourn. Grant to all who are bereaved the comfort and hope that because Jesus Christ has risen, all who die in the Lord will live with you in your everlasting kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Mighty God, strengthen us as brothers and sisters in Christ so that we may obey your will. Keep all your shepherds faithful to your word especially Bishop Dan and his staff, Dean Nathan, Pastor Todd, Pastor Nelson, Pastor Henry, your unworthy servant, and all clergy in the Carolinas Mission region, so that they may speak your truth to the flocks to which you have sent them. Inspire us to speak for Christ, so that all would come to know your love. Lord, in your mercy. Your Merciful Lord, be with our brothers and sisters whose congregations are discerning the call for a new pastor, especially Christ United, St. James, Mount Calvary, and Grace Lutheran Churches. Assure them of your Holy Spirit's presence throughout the call process and guide us to be good neighbors to them during their transition. Bless their interim pastors as they lead them through this season of change. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your abundant mercy, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Please share that peace with your neighbor. We'll now sing, Lord Jesus, Think on Me, number 309.
invite you to stand as you are able. Yes, be fruitful, Lord, and fill to the brim our cup of blessing. Gather a harvest from the seeds that were sown, that we may be fed with the bread of life. Gather the hopes and dreams of all, unite them with the prayers we offer. Grace our table with your presence, and give us a foretaste of the feast to come. Father, we offer with joy and thanksgiving what you have first given us, ourselves, our time, and our possessions, signs of your gracious love. Receive them for the sake of him who offered himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. We give you thanks, Father, through Jesus Christ, your beloved Son whom you sent in this end of the ages to save and redeem us and to proclaim to us your will. He is your word, inseparable from you. Through him you created all things and in him you take delight. He is your word, sent from heaven to a virgin's womb. He there took on our nature and our lot and was shown forth as your son, born of the Holy Spirit and of the Virgin Mary. It is he, our Lord Jesus, who fulfilled all your will and won for you a holy people. He stretched out his hands in suffering in order to free from suffering those who trust you. It is he who handed over to a death he freely accepted in order to destroy death to break the bonds of the evil one, to crush hell underfoot, and to give light to the righteous, to establish his covenant, and to show forth the resurrection. Taking bread, giving thanks to you, he said, take and eat. This is my body, broken for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, this is my blood poured out for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering then his death and resurrection, we lift this bread and cup before you, giving you thanks that you have made us worthy to stand before you and to serve you as your priestly people. And we ask you, send your spirit upon these gifts of your church. Gather into one all who share this bread and wine, Fill us with your Holy Spirit to establish our faith in truth that we may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him, all honor and glory are yours. Almighty Father, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, both now and forever. Amen. 
Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. The meal is ready.
invite you to stand as you are able. Now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Lord, now you let your servant Son, both as a sacrifice for sin and a model of the godly life, enable us to receive him always with thanksgiving and to conform our lives to his through the same Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Just a short reminder, because of the mood of the season, we will depart in silence. Um, but before then, we will sing number 91, Savior, when in dust to you.
Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.